wonderful to see everyone out here this afternoon. Isn't God wonderful, isn't he? He's a great God. This is an old song. It says, just over in the glory land. Won't it be wonderful when we get there? Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand and let's worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Now the home prepared where the saints abide. Just over in the
to that day to see that trip take place. Hallelujah. You're talking about a cruise. Hallelujah. Cruise out of this world. Man, I'm telling you what. I'm ready to take it with the Lord. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer while you're standing. Amen. Let's pray for those that's unable to make it tonight. God knows and God sees where they're at and He cares where they're at tonight and He wants them to be touched and healed tonight. Whatever may be holding them back from being here, God, God wants to touch that need tonight. I know God will. Amen. If you got a need, lift your hand. God knows about it tonight. Let's pray for your need. Let's agree together. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bind together tonight. Lord, we always thank you for the opportunity to come and lift you up, Lord. And we pray for the needs, God, of those that's not able to be here, Lord, for different reasons. Whatever it may be, I pray, Lord, that you touch them tonight. I pray that you'll reach out, Lord, and touch their bodies, touch their situation. Lord, where they can open the door, where they can be here to worship and magnify you. God, we ask you to touch those who are here tonight, and we pray that the Holy Ghost would anoint every song, every person, every hand that went up tonight. Meet the need in their bodies, Lord. You are a miracle worker. You're a healer, Lord, and we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. We give you the praise, the glory, and honor, and the church said amen. God bless you. Give the Lord a hand clap while you're seated tonight. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. You can be seated. I'd like to just testify tonight for our prayer meeting Monday night. We had two miracles take place. Ain't that awesome? Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. Two miracles. Hallelujah. If you need a miracle, Monday night prayer meeting is a place to be. Amen. Amen. You can turn off the television and come to prayer meeting, but you can have a move of God on Monday night. So if you weren't here, you missed a good time. We did have two miracles. And uh, we just love what God does on Monday night. It's just a focused prayer time, and we had a good time. But Tonight, we're going to have a good time. Everybody ready to have a good time tonight? Amen. Praise the Lord. So thankful for the Lord giving us all breath to be here tonight, opportunity to be here. Amen. Brother Terry, come. Let's get our offering tonight. Get it tonight. Give you a chance to give. And the Lord will bless you for it tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I think our cake auction turned out well Sunday, too. Guys done a good raising, uh, fundraiser on that. We appreciate all the help on that and all the cakes that were made. Uh, so we appreciate that. Brother Haley, ask the Lord to bless this offering tonight.
Wednesday night. Amen. Y'all pray for me. I forgot to pick up somebody for church. My Lord, I had to run. I just thought about it. I said, Josh, go pick these kids up. Amen. But they'll be all right. They, they'll make it time for class. Sister Lane's going to bless us with a song tonight. Everybody say, Lord, bless her well. Oh, no. 
so true. So many days I catch myself wondering, could this be the day that the Lord's ready to take us home? Praise the Lord. I'm thankful that this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. Amen. We had a, another song lined up. It didn't work out tonight, so I was thinking it'd be good to hear Brother Larry Kelly and Vince Kelly sing. I, I've, uh, I done been told that story. Brother Kelly's done told me. I guess he, he wanted to tell me before everybody else did that the preacher told him, says, don't never sing again. <laughs> oh, Brother Kelly, we love y'all. Appreciate you. And uh, Brother Vince, you don't have to hide back there. We're going to let you slide, okay? They did tell me, Brother Vince, you was the best sounding out of all of them, though. Praise the Lord. Is it good to be in the house? It's good to have fun in the house of the Lord. It, you know, if you can't have fun, what, what, what is needed to be in a Christian? Amen. And I want to have fun. I mean, I, I like to have, I, I'm serious about living for God, but if I can't have fun, I'm going to find something else to do. But it's fun living for God. I, I love it. I like to have fun. Like like Sunday, the, the cake auction, we've done a good, she's, and it was fun. I just had a blast. And and things like that's fun. And, and if you don't take time for fun, you're going to mess yourself up. Amen. So we got to have a little fun. Hallelujah. I think our teenagers got class tonight, and I don't. You got enough children to have children's church as well, y'all. All right. Pray. We love our children and our teenagers and our nursery class. So you guys can be dismissed tonight. Amen. And uh, so you guys enjoy the the words you hear tonight and soak it in. My wife's already taught me your lesson, so I know what you're talking about tonight over there. So uh, Tonight is Bible study night. Everybody say Bible study. If you got your Bible, lift it high as you can tonight. Raise your Bible up. If it's iPhone, raise it up. iPad, raise it up. That's what we, we all got a Bible. It's good. If you don't have a Bible, find one. We're going to go to the book of Joshua tonight. Um, I've been reading through Joshua this week, and it's just got a lot of good stuff here in Joshua, and we're going to show you some things. and. Uh, about Joshua and I think of maybe help us in our life and help us where we need to go and what we need to be doing. Praise the Lord. Joshua 10 verse number 8. You don't have to stand right now. I'm going to talk to you a little bit before we read and uh, we're just going to kind of treat tonight if it's all right. Uh, I've never been a real good teacher because I always get carried away preaching and it's something about the word that excites me. I don't know how people can have a well, I, I, that's people. That's, there's got to be a calling, a gift, I guess, to have a teaching voice that never changes, and you can just talk like this and never changes. It, it has to be a talent or something. But to me, it's a. I just can't. When I get the word going in me, it's like, oh, it just rolls. So I'm gonna try to slow down tonight and kind of show us some things I feel like will help us. But uh, I've been in church a long time, and I think there are some people that seem to be unmovable in a church. You know, they really take that song literally. I shall not be. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. And they're right. They shall not be moved. But they are there. They, uh, I understand that they have a certain pattern of thinking. And don't we all? Everybody say, I'm glad she don't think like me. Aren't you glad that the person don't think like you? Because it will be a messed up world if we all thought alike. So we all think wrong or differently, whether if it's rightly or wrongly. We all got different thinking. And when, when we set in our ways, I, I've, I've had people tell me a lot, Brother Hunt, uh, especially when I, when I first got into ministry or even youth pastor or even especially pastor and people tell me, said, Brother Hunt, I'm telling you, this is who I am. This is the way it's going to be, and I'm not a-changing. And I say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. But I, I've had people say that. But you know, change is okay. It is okay. Now, some people say they won't never change, but then you'll catch them doing some little changing where it makes it easier. So, but sometimes uh, people get set in their ways, unmovable, and they get to thinking rightly or wrongly, whether, whatever it is. And sometimes the wrong thinking that comes in their mind or their heart can even, even though it's wrong thinking, after a while, you're going to think it's okay, though. It, it, it becomes right, you know. And it really don't matter your age at, at this point either. I'm not talking about, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 85 years old. I'm sitting. No, that's not the case because I've seen 21-year-olds that get set in their ways and mamas and dads saying, amen, <laughs> hallelujah. 
Uh, uh, our kids, they seem like they just won't change. They get some thought in their mind, and they just, that's it. That's just how it is. And, and so it's not, a, it's not a certain age here. God gives us all, I believe, a, a special touch to fight against the enemy. And I think it, every one of us tonight's got something special inside of us. And, and to me, uh, uh, my wife's asked me one time, she says, you act like nothing ever bothers you. You never worry. You see, that's something God put in me that, that I can fight against because I know that I can't change it, but God can. So why would I worry myself to, to take, to, to, uh, to the point I get to take, I have to take nerve pills because I'm so nervous about things when there's nothing I can do about it except to say, God, can you change it? And then God, so I'm, I'm kind of, that's my, my gift and what God's given me. But the, but the first generation, and we're going to read here in just a minute, but the first generation of the children of Israel, they were told that they had a special touch of the, on them. Y'all remember uh, Joshua and Caleb, they stood up and said, hey, we can do this. They, we got the power. We actually can do this. But, but, but they stood on the shore of the promised land for years. They washed, marched around the wilderness, and they kept saying, there's no way that we can take that land. There's no way we can go through there. No way we can take these walls out. So, so they just made a peace with it. And this is where we get sometimes, uh, where they should have destroyed it right away, but they just made a peace of being in the wilderness. And sometimes we get a peace with our lifestyle. Well, it's just the way it is. I'm never going to be nothing. And we get that peace. And, uh, and so the children of Israel, what they done was they lived below what God had for them for years. And uh, I'm going to tell the church something tonight. We've got something God has got planned for us. And we can stay where we're at or we can go claim what God's got for us. How many is ready to claim what God's got for you? So... So today, as many people, even today, they, they, they make peace with things that are, are uh, I would say, in their mind, with things that, have, uh, that they could have left a long time ago. And they could have, but they live with less than what God intended them to have because they feel like, well, it's just the way it is. People who have been in this way for years, you know, and, and I'm, I'm counting myself because I've been here since I was 15 or 12 years old, matter of fact, and, and now I'm 42, so you figured it up. But, but a lot of people for years have been in this, and they got things that were uh, uh, entrenched in them, if you would. Uh, other words, it's dug deep in their lives, and, and, and they can't really, even though the Word says this is the, this and that, and it, it just... You know, thou shalt, thou shalt not, is so entrenched in their life that they believe in their selves and they think in their bodies and their spiritual lives that it's nothing wrong with it. Because even though the word says thou shalt not, but it's been entrenched in us by our families or by our co-workers or by our uh, relatives and, 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 and it gets so entrenched in us that they feel like it's no wrong anymore. And there is an enemy that has made peace with them in this point. There's an enemy that has came in their lives, whether if it was when they was 18, an enemy come in. And guess what? Anybody that teaches you against the word of God, friend, is your enemy. They may smile. They may take you to lunch. And they might even buy you a steak dinner. But guess what? If they are against the word of God, it's your enemy. They will be nice. They'll come in and they entrench things in you that's not the word of God. Now we're going to go to our text, Joshua 10. And I just want to let you be seated tonight if that's okay because I'm going to read a few verses and I'm going to try to pronounce some of these names. But uh, if, if I get them wrong, you just forgive me. If I, I, I thought about if I, had a, uh, if I had a little USB plugger here, I would put Brother Patton on. Brother Patton's dad has got the whole Bible on a, a USB in my office, and his dad had left that for him. That man could say the words of the Bible, I'm telling you. But I, I'm not as good as he is, but I do know what the word means. Joshua 10 and 8 says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto the, them suddenly and went up from Gilgad all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way where it goeth up to Beth Horon and to smote them to Azkai and unto Machiada. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azkai and they died. And they were more which and they were more which died with hailstones than them which the children of Israel slew with a sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. 
And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people of the, avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven and hasted not to go down upon the whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of the man, of a man, for the Lord's fault for Israel. And Joshua returned all of Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Machaeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in the cave of Machaeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave, and set men by it for, the, for, the, for two keep them. And stay yet not, stay ye not, but pursue after the, your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them, suffer them not to enter into the cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. I want to preach a little while or teach a little while tonight. Let no enemy have control. And sometimes the enemy will make a puppet out of us. The enemy will put us on puppet strings, and it'll make us do exactly what they want. But we, got, we cannot let no enemy have control tonight. There, are, there is a time, I, I feel, for every born-again Christian tonight, everybody that's been born again, there's going to come a time in your life that, uh, that hell's going to throw everything it can at you. Hell's going to throw everything it can. I mean, you name it, they're going to throw it. There, there's no doubt even people here tonight, probably even while I'm talking to you, has hell being thrown at you right now every direction. Seem like every time you turn around, you're getting sick. Every time you turn around, something's happened on the job. Every time you turn around, the bank account's too low to pay the bills at the end of the month. And, and it seems like just hell is flying against us and against our bodies, against our, our soul, our spirit, our mind. And the devil's out to get. He's out to seek and to, and to kill, destroy, whatever he can do. He's out to do it. But remember, if we're born again, we've got power over the enemy. We got a power to stop him. Even against our past, the devil tries to come in and destroy us with that. We're, we're being fought against all kinds and all manners from this world. Everything you think about is coming against us. Even as the children were in Joshua 3, if you want to leave your Bibles open to Joshua, we're going to read quite a bit out of Joshua. But as the children of Israel were in Joshua chapter 3, verse number 9, Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from them before you the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Hivites and the Pezzites, and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. And everybody say, All the Amites. Every one of them. Amen. He said, I'm going to get rid of all the Amites. Even termites, if they're there, they're going to be gone too. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the earth passeth over before you into the Jordan. I read all them ites for that verse number 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now I want you to notice that the ark was a sim it symbolized something. It was a symbol of Christ. The ark uh, went first, symbolizing the presence and the power of God. And I want the church to know a promise of God uh, is upon us. And if we will let God go first, things will work better. Come on, before you take a job, let God go first. Before you buy a car, let God go first. Before you, come on, before you pray for somebody, let God go first. Before you open your mouth, let God go first. You'll be, you'll be a lot su uh, surprised of what, how your voice would change if you let God speak for you first. Come on, because a lot of the flesh don't speak the way it should speak. But, but anyway, putting God first. Now, you got to remember about the Jordan here because th they went across the Jordan here and the covenant and they took the ark of the Lord with them first. And so you got to remember something about Jordan was Jordan River was where Christ was baptized. Jordan River was where the Holy Ghost came up on Christ and, and, and in a profound way that even deliberately the people standing around could tell that it was the Holy Ghost that come up on him. It was the Jordan River that the Father spoke from heaven. You know what it was symbolizing is the, uh, it symbolizes the covenant of Christ going through the river first was this perfect covenant because it was a promising that we're going to drive out all of our enemies that come before us. I told somebody the other day, I said, there's a power in baptizing. Because they, they, this person was talking with me and, and they said, I'm kind of worried about if I'm going to live for God, I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I, and I, I looked at him, I shook his hand, I said, I want to thank you for that because I appreciate it. And I understand what you're saying because you're either going to be real or not, not going to do it at all. And, but I did tell him, I said, there's a power in baptism. 
Because once you go down in the water of baptizing, the, the spirit inside of you, every time your flesh goes to do something wrong, the spirit comes up and says, you know, that's not right. And it puts that, that but used to, used to before, it was like it didn't bother you to say words, these kind of words. But now that you've been baptized in Jesus' name, all your sins been washed away. Now you know that, uh, hey, I can't go that route. So there is a power in baptism in Jesus' name. There is a special power in that. So I believe that. So they went through this promising uh, to gain victory. And, and guess what? They, they realized that, that they couldn't gain this victory with, on their own strength. They had to have the Lord to go before them. You only can last so long because, you know, if you're, if you're living on uh, money, it's going to run out sooner or later. You know, it, it, one day it's probably not going to be any good. I don't know when that's going to be. I hope I'm going on to be with Jesus at that time. I hope rapture's taking place. But, but see, it's going to come a time that the only thing we, any of us can lean on is Jesus. That's the only thing we can lean on. We, uh, we got to understand we got to have the victories. We, it's good to gather together and worship. And I love to worship. Uh, I, I'm, I'm riding here with the best of you. I love to worship. And that's great. But the main thing is what we got to let Christ go before us is for, to help us win our victories that we got to have. We got some battles to still fight. We got some battles, big battles that's going to be on our mind. But we got to let the Lord go before us. Now we can be a people that are, are, you know, if we let the Lord go before us, we can be a people that are supernaturally empowered to go and possess what God's got. You know, just something about it, being uh, superly or filled with the Holy Ghost, there's something about it that the, I guess any ordinary person w- really couldn't do. You say, what do you mean when you say ordinary person? I mean, uh, people that are, have not had the Holy Ghost, they, they haven't been enabled by the Scripture. When God says, when you come to Him, you're going to have a new heart. A new mind, a new soul. And so, see, you got some extra. You're not, you're not just a, uh, when I say ordinary, I mean people that's not full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's going to be hard to fight against the uh, enemy because, you see, when you're out of the church, you can fight against flesh and blood. But when you have the Holy Ghost, you realize that a lot of things are spiritual things. And, and we're, we're dealing with a spiritual uh, a problem in our world today. And, and, I haven't preached on this in a while. I think it would be a good time to spit it out. And I'm going to try to stay close to my notes because if I can get done with this, I'll be lucky. But, but tonight we're in a spiritual problem that our generation is not realizing because they're not letting Christ go before them. In other words, and th- this is really not going to go over very well, especially with our other, younger generation. But we're in a spiritual fight and, the, and it's blinding us to the point we don't think that we're here because we, we're not letting Christ go before us. Let me give you some examples tonight. Uh, the music that we let come in our heads. A spiritual battle comes right then, and automatically we think, well, that's not bothering me. You're right. It's not bothering you because you're not letting the Holy Ghost go before you. You see, if you let the Holy Ghost go before you, then you know, I shouldn't buy that CD. I shouldn't watch that on that TV. I shouldn't, I shouldn't turn it on a rated R movie. But see, when you don't have the Holy Ghost, you won't even remember to pray over your meal. Come on, y'all see what I'm saying? Because you get so involved in what's in front of you that you're not thinking about letting Christ go first. You see, before we eat, we should let Christ go first. Before we, before we go to bed, Christ should be first. Uh, before we turn our radio on, we ought to say, is this a God thing? If Christ is before everything we do, we will be all right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Boy, that'll preach right there, but I'm going to go somewhere else with that. Um, we, we can do these things. We, we got to have a new heart, a new mind, new soul. And David said this uh, uh, about not being just not ordinary people because he says, those, those that know their God, he says, those, they will be strong and they will do exploits. What is what he saying? He says, if you know your God, if you know who I'm talking about, you'll be able to be strong. You'll be able to run with a horseman, not just a footman, but you'll be able to run with a horseman. That means that we'll be able to accomplish things that, that we're not able to accomplish with a, with a natural power. You see what I'm saying? We'll be able to go beyond the natural and, and the natural reasoning or even a goodwill person can't do some things just because they're good people, but without the, the Holy Ghost and letting God lead them. There will be people that God will have in the earth that will probably, and no doubt we have them here tonight, that you simply believe there's only one God. Does everybody here believe that tonight, or do I need to stop and do a Bible study right now? 
We believe there's one God. We believe that. And, and I know tonight that there's a lot of life concepts out there, and there's a lot of different concepts about life and what people believe and where people go. But uh, the bottom line is there is only one God. There's only one way. There's only one eternal life. There's only one way to eternal life. There's only one resurrection, and there's only one salvation. But if we go back to Joshua 6, if you go back over there, you'll find out uh, some things took place here. They, they won a big battle. They went through the Jordan, and then they come up to the wall of Jericho. I mean, think about it. How many of you ever had a great Sunday night service? I call this uh, them having a Sunday night service. They walked through the dry land on Jordan. They just had a Sunday night service. And then they walk across Sunday night service up to, to look at a wall that Y'all ever been there on a, on, a, on Sunday night? You just run all over the place, you shout it. But Monday morning, man, the devil was staring at you in the face. So I feel like they had a good Sunday night service here, walking across on dry ground. Then all of a sudden, they come to Jericho. Jericho was a, what I would say, that word I used a while ago, that entrenched place in your life. Those things the devil has entrenched. And these walls were entrenched in the ground real deep. It was a problem that they ran into, and, and, and sometimes in our life, walls get dug so deep, and they will not be moved, and we stand. We, we, we have great miracles. We get healed. We had two miracles, known miracles, Monday night. We had two miracles about a, uh, uh, last uh, about two or three weeks ago here at the church that, that people testified to me about. So we, we have having miracles taking place right here in our church, but yet and still, it comes to the Jericho walls in our life, and we get stuck. Some of you, you, you had to fight that battle when you crossed over the Jordan. You, 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 you heard the gospel. You came in and, I mean, you went, you went, you saw the river. You, you got into the baptistry. You get into the baptistry. You get baptized. You feel real good. Uh, doesn't it feel good? It does. He said he feels good tonight. Doesn't it feel good? She said, yes, it does. It feels good when you go into water. Brother Claude, did it feel good when you come out of the water the other night? It feels good when we get baptized and we come to that, we come to that river and we understand, hey, that, that's Christ. But beyond the river, then all of a sudden these walls come up. Is it possible? Can, can I really, you know, I, I've got a challenge here. Can I really live this that, I, that Brother Hunt's preaching? We come against the wall. It seems like I can't, I can't go from here. And we, we feel good. We, we worship God. We, we sing good with the choir and we worship good. We, we felt really good. But then all of a sudden we come to a wall that I seem like I can't live what's being preached. And then you, the devil tries to, after you done cross the Jordan, you done got through the water, then all of a sudden the devil tries to tell you, you might as well quit because you can't change your old lifestyle. But see, mama always told me when I was growing up, boy, that's not even a word, can't. You need to take the trash out. I, I can't. Yeah, you can. She told me right away I could. So a lot of times that, that word, can't, is not in the dictionary. We got to get back to the point and realize I can. I can get rid of my old lifestyle. It may take me a little while, but when we crossed over Jordan, when we cross over Jordan, I want to tell you, don't quit worshiping God when you cross over Jordan. When they crossed over Jordan, we know they had to walk, walk seven days and not say a word. But on that seventh day, the Bible says they shouted. Friend, I'm here to tell you, if you'll shout when you come out of the water, don't quit shouting because your old lifestyle is still hanging around. Don't quit shouting. Don't quit, don't, don't, don't quit believing. But see, when you start doubting, the wall keeps standing. Fear became... Uh, in their lives, when they looked at the wall, all of a sudden, the priest had to sit down and preach to them a while. Tell them what's going on. This is what's got to take place. And we're fixing to have a new converts class for all of you guys that's interested starting next Sunday. Not this Sunday, but next Sunday. We're going to have a great time explaining to you where you can go, what you can do, what, what's next down the line. But, but tonight, until then, until you get it all under your belt... The best thing you can do is don't quit worshiping God. Keep praising God. Keep reaching to God. And, and when they begin to worship around this wall and they begin to shout as the, they was commanded to do, the walls came crumbling down. And they realized when the walls fell, this is what they realized. They realized the battle wasn't theirs after all. The battle belongs to God. And when you realize that, guess what? You will win the battle. When you realize it's not yours, it's God. I think the biggest battle we have 
is wondering when we come across Jordan, this river, the water, as we got baptized, we come, when we come at the biggest battle that we have in our mind is that we, but we think, can I really live that? Can I really change? Am I going to be faithful? This is one of the biggest problems that I was talking to this young man the other day. He says, I just want to know that I can live it when I make that commitment. Well, friend, I'm here to tell you, the only way you're going to be able to ever get anywhere is put one foot in front of the other and fight the devil tooth and toenail. He's a fighter. He's not going to quit fighting you when you get baptized. He's not going to quit fighting you just because you prayed at the church before prayer, before the service started. He's not going to quit fighting you because you paid your tithes last Sunday. Guess what? He's going to fight you even more. But when you put your foot down on his head and bruise your heel with his head, guess what? You can show him who's in, who, who's in control. We cannot let the devil have control of the enemy in our lives at all. But I want to tell you tonight that we will have to go through Jericho. We will have to, every one of us, we will face our walls in our life. I know I did when I, when I first got in this way. I thought about it today as I was finishing up. I thought about, uh, I got to that wall in my life. But you know what I did when I was about 12 years old? When I got to that wall, I didn't know. My family wasn't living for God. Nobody believed this way, and nobody would take me to the church. And I had to ride my bike sometimes to church, and I had to make sure. But I was making sure I got to that wall. And I began to look at all these other young folks and all these other mid age folks. They were shouting all over the place. You know what I don't? I just started doing. I didn't know why they were shouting. I just started shouting with them. I didn't know why they was clapping their hands. I just clapped my hands with them. I didn't know why. You know, and I'm going to be honest with you. Can I, can I be honest with you tonight? I was sitting here thinking a moment ago, and it come across my mind. And I thought, man, when I was growing up, when one person stood up in a church to clap their hands, everybody stood up and clapped their hands. Y'all don't remember that. That's the only church. That must have been in, up that part of Tennessee. Maybe not this part of Tennessee. Mississippi, too. But when I was growing up, man, when somebody jumped up and said, hallelujah, the whole church Hey man, I'm not talking about just the, the mid age or the old age or the, or the babies, but I'm talking about mama would even grab the two year old. Get up, boy. She, he said, stand up. Y'all remember that? I remember that. Mama used to yank me out under the pew when I was about six years old. Y'all thought I was going to say 16, didn't you? But when I was about six years old, get out under that pew when she would go to church with me and she wouldn't let me lay down and lay around in church. She said, we're having church. But what's happening is we've gotten away from the worship. Friend, I'm here to tell you the most powerful thing you can do in the house of God is worship. Because it brings victories. The devil says, you don't feel good, you better not worship. And guess what? Uh, and and I, about 95% of the time, he wins here at Carnival. Am I telling the truth? Am I te- well, I'm not that type of person. Guess what? He wins. Uh, but I got news for the devil. I'm going to shout until I die. I may not shout as loud when I get 70 years old, but I'm still going to be trying my best. Y'all hear what I'm saying tonight? Don't lose your praise. When you get against your walls of your life, they're coming, they're coming. I, I, I got something for you here. Let me just hang on. I got to hurry. I, I, know, I know tonight that, that sometimes um, when I got that point, I just shouted like Israel, and I had to get my walls to fall as well, and I had to shout. But after Jericho... And they won, they, we know the story, how they won the battle there, and the walls came tumbling down. But after Jericho, in chapter 7 and 8, and I'm working my way to chapter 10, so we're going to go here real quick, in, in a little town called Ai. But uh, what, what they done, they won a battle here, but they had to do it with much soul, uh, much soul search and determination. And not only that, they had to work, do it with obedience. And a lot of times that word obedience, when, I, when you say that, people just, oh, what is he talking about? But this is the second lesson that they learned here, that to have great victories, you, and you want them tonight. I know we want victories, but to have great, the great victories, we, got to, uh, we can't have none of those great victories without obedience to God. You've got to obey God's word. You've got to obey what the word of God says. And I'm going to say this right now. You'd be surprised how much easier your life would be if you would line up with what your pastor's preaching to you. You can put on the mask all you want to. You can act like it's all right all you want to. But until you line up with the word and put the word out front of you, that's your light. That's your, that's your lamp to your pathway. The word of God is, is, this is Christ. Amen. We could keep preaching about that, but this is Christ. Put it out in front of us uh, until you line up with the word. Hey, I'm not here to tell you this is opinion that I'm preaching. I don't preach opinions. Somebody say amen. 
I don't preach opinions. I don't preach the word and say, I think the word is saying this. No, when I put the word out, I want to say, this is what God says that we have to do. So whatever I preach from this pulpit, I do not preach opinions. Without fight, without a fight, you just have to, you just become a servant. You just become somebody that sits around. But if you have a fight in you, you will be a, you will see victories in your life. So we, we come through and they won that battle in seven and eight. Then in chapter nine, something very interesting happened in verse, in chapter nine. It was a very powerful enemy that, uh, comes in and it's, and it simply just bends his knee. And it was the, if I say it right, it was the Gibeonites that came in and they came in and bowed their knee down to the children of Israel. Without a fight, they came in the enemy. Now remember, these are the enemy. They came in without a fight and they came in and bowed a knee down and told them this, says, we're going to be your water boy and we're going to bring wood to you when you need it. Read read your scripture later. You can find out what he said. We're going to bring you the water and wood as you need it. So, but now remember, this is the enemy that came in and started bowing down to Israel. We just stop to think here, there are some things in life, in our lives, I can say all of our lives, that may have lost its power against you, but it still lingers around. There's a lot of enemies that have in your life, and I'm going to show you what I mean. I I have many friends of mine that are, are sick. They have a sickness in their life. For instance, my boy's got a sickness in their life. God hasn't chose to heal them yet. God hasn't healed this diabetes that they have. And some of you tonight, if you got a sickness in your life, raise your hand. You, God has not chose to heal you yet. But you know what? With the Holy Ghost, guess what God does? He gives you power to deal with it. There's something about it. You say, what are you trying to say, brother? Just, just bear with me a minute. Just as the enemy here at the, uh, the uh, Gibeonites, they bow the knee down to Israel to their, and also to, the, to God, to their God, they bow their knee down. They became the drawer of the water and of the wood. They brought the wood and the water for them as they needed it. And just like Paul, y'all remember Paul had a thorn in his flesh? Paul had that thorn in his flesh, and he even asked God three times, God, get rid of this thorn out of my flesh. Pretty much what God told him was, I'm not going to do it. I thought about that today, and as I was getting ready, I said, Lord, why wouldn't you get rid of Paul's thorn? Why wouldn't you take... I don't know what Paul's thorn was. Maybe it was arthritis. Maybe it was chest pains. Maybe whatever it was. It was a thorn in his flesh. But Paul, God says, I'm not going to get rid of it. He said, but Paul, I want to tell you something. My grace is sufficient for thee. So I, this, this is where as I begin to read. This is where I see, I see that he was probably told Paul, he says, you need that thorn in your flesh, Paul. You need that arthritis if that's what it was. You need that thorn in your flesh, Paul. Why why do you say that, Brother Hunt? Because he probably looked at Paul and says, these thorns are going to bring you water when you need it. Everybody with me? The servant brought the water to him as they needed it. He brought the wood as they needed it. He says, these thorns are going to put you on your knees and have you praying when you need me. You see, they could have destroyed the children of Israel long before these Gibeonites could. They could have came in a long time ago and destroyed them in the past, but God kept them because they were a strong city. If you read the scripture, you'll find out they were a strong city. But they, but now, instead of destroying them, now they're bringing them a cold glass of water. Now hear me tonight, the enemy still comes through our doors. Even though we are Christians, we're Holy Ghost filled, the enemy is still going to come through our door. But the good thing about it, after you come to God, you put God first, the enemy don't have the authority he used to have. Isn't it good to have the power over the enemy? Is anybody glad like I am? I can say, enemy, get thee behind me. He may come in my house. Hallelujah. I'm getting way ahead of my notes, but he might come in and... But you know what? He comes in. That's got to help me understand, Brother John. When the enemy comes against me, that helps me to understand something. That Jesus Christ is my source. And he of, of our living water supply. That's what he is. He's our source of our living water supply. So when the enemy comes in, that lets me know all I got to say is, hey, I need a drink of water. Whether if I'm on the mountain or the mountain's on top of me. I've been to both of them. How about y'all? I, I, some days it seems like the mountain's on top of me, but, but let me tell you, church, tonight the presence of God is all that we need. Just the presence of the Lord is all we need. 
this is really going to blow y'all's mind because you know I'm a faith preacher and I'm a, I like to lay hands on, I like to see people healed, I like to testify about miracles. But you know what? We need the presence of God. We don't need to be free from all of our struggles. We don't need to be free from every trial that's around us. We simply just need an everlasting water is what we need. Because, see, if you was free and you didn't have no problems and worries tonight, uh, you wouldn't have no need for Jesus. You don't need to be totally free. Therefore, all the things the enemy surrounds us with ju- just reminds us that I, I, I have a drink. I have a well that I can drink from. All of my problems that I, can, that I have a place I can run to, Jesus is my refuge. Jesus is a place I can run in when I need a touch. So when the old pain comes in, and that old depression comes a knocking in your life and the, at your door and, and, and the enemy comes in and he's telling you you're going to be sick today, you're going to be tired today, you're not going to feel good today. And some of you think I've been at your house today already, don't you? But when the enemy comes in and he says all this and the enemy comes to your house and, and Brother Manning, he comes in and says, you're too tired to go to Wednesday night service and you might as well stay in the recliner. You didn't have time to eat supper. No way. You should, you should, da, 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 da. And, oh, you know you're hurting tonight. You should have stayed at home. You know what you should tell them? You should look at him and say, well, you mind filling up my glass of ice water? Oh, and by the way, on your way out, will you put another log of wood on the fire? That's where we have control over the enemy. We should not let the enemy have control over us. We're victory people. We, we have victory or we can be, we can be destroyed ourselves. I, I, chose, I choose to have victory. How about you? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. So there are victories we have as, as a child of God that ordinary people wouldn't have. People that don't go to church don't have because they don't have these victories. They don't understand the victories that we're talking about. So in chapter 10, and and get ready to to, uh, end this in about 45 minutes. In chapter 10 here, there were five powerful kings. They rose up. If you go back to the beginning of that chapter, you can read it later. But they rose up and they said, you know what? This is enough. These children of Israel, they're treating us like slaves. They're making us bring their water. They're making us bring their wood. And in our text, it says here that, that, that they said that we had enough. And, and Joshua 10 here, you're talking about hell. Hell began to come against the, uh, their victory that they was having. And it tells them, this this as far as you're going. You're not going to go any further. And so you, we, as you see here, the battle starts. And so what they were saying is, we come to stop you. These five kings got together and said, we're going to stop this. And guess what? The enemy wants to come in right now and stop what God has planned for you, planned for your church, planned for your family. He wants to stop it victory that you ever had but you know what we can't let the enemy have control over us come on we can't let him have control the first thing the enemy is going to do is he's going to get right here he's going to get in this mind of yours and he's going to tell you this he's going to tell you that but what we've got to learn to do is put the enemy back where he was and say hey dude i'm getting kind of thirsty how about a drink of water so he come to stop him and now this is what this wasn't a season of shouting for the, for the children of Israel here. The, you know, how many remembers when you became a new convert? You, you just got into church, man. You couldn't, the preacher couldn't sit you down enough. You shouted all over the place. You, you, if, if they wasn't having church at your church, you go to a church down the road that was having church. You wanted to have church every time you turn around. You look at the preacher and say, man, we need to add a service. Uh, we need to add this. Uh, you get so excited. You know, I remember those. I was one of those. And I remember the times that I shouted. I was shouting so much, and I wonder why the older Christians didn't shout. They just sit there and looked at you. Now, I didn't, I didn't realize now my day has come, and I, my day is going to be there. Now, my day is coming. But, but, but I, when I was growing up, I thought, man, they look so burdened down. They look so sad. Why can't they be excited? And I, I remember that's, that's the new, new Christian style. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what I mean? Those, that's why you got to keep new converts in church. You got to keep new blood coming. You got to keep those excited. You know, those that, that don't, that, those that say, Brother Hunt, let me go to the hospitals with you. Let me go do something with you. Let me work. Let, let me, you know, we need some new converts. Everybody say amen. So I like that. Now, not realizing that that day comes for everybody. That day comes to a point that you get to the walls. You get to the uh, uh, 
probably, probably no doubt maybe those five kings have come into your life that I'm fixing to talk about. Those five kings are, are here and it's trying to throw all hell against you. You know, now, now you're not the person you used to be. You're, you're weaker. You're, you're more frail. You're, you're, you're down in your spirit. I'm talking about spiritually, not just, not just, uh, um, uh, physically, but spiritually wise tonight. Sometimes we get to that point, but hear me tonight. No doubt all hell was coming against him here. And God spoke to Joshua. In our opening text here in 10 and 8, he says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them in thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgad all night. Now if you look up Gilgad, it's talking about a place of separation. And and that's what Gilgad meant. There were there are many in the children of Israel as they walked through the wilderness they went and kind of guess what Moses was talking about and many of them got by without getting circumcised so what that meant was they they had no mark of separation on them they they just kind of blended in with the people but they wasn't having any separation and I'm going to try to hurry through this but I really want you to understand about this separation because I feel in our generation today this is where all of us are at right now uh, people have come to the camp or the church, if you want to put it that way, and they've come in, but they're not separated. People want what we feel, and people want the church services we have. They want our worship, and they want to be baptized in Jesus' name, but as far as being have separation, I don't want that. And this is where we're at today. They, they come in, but they don't want to be separated from their ways, or, or maybe I should say from the world's ways. So what they want to have is a, a dual life going on. I want to feel good. I want the church service. I want to be a part of CFPC. But, but now, if i got to do anything different now, separation, but I want to tell the church something. There's a power in separation. There's an unspeakable power in separate. I can't explain what it is, uh, but it's something supernatural inside of you of separation. But what we learn here is from without, uh, without separation or desire to be separated for the purpose of God. And there, there, there is no strength if you don't have that desire to be separated. There's no strength. Y'all remember Samson? Samson was the man that uh, he, he had separation. He was born a Nazarite. We know how he was born. And the, the, his mark was his long hair. He had that strength. That mark set him apart from the people of his time. And uh, now the separation gave him his strength. Since he was different, his hair grew long. His separation gave his strength. But catch this. When he started playing with his separation, or maybe I should say it this way, when he let somebody else play with his separation. That'll preach right there a while, wouldn't it? How many times when we have a separation that we get a good buddy or a good girlfriend or a good boyfriend, they start playing with our separation? Oh, man. And before you know it, you would have no more separation. You are among the children of God, but not a part of the children of God because your separation has left. So when Samson began to let someone else play with it, play with his strength, guess what happened? He lost his strength. There's a strength in separation. You can't look and smell like the world and expect to be as strong as God's people. There's a difference. Church, we have to be separated for God's purpose that he has. Now, every one of us tonight have a different person, I mean, a purpose for God that God's got for you in your life. God may have you teaching. He may have you doing uh, singing or preaching, but there's a purpose in your life. God has created, but without separation, you will not be effective in that. Oh, you can go to college and they can teach you how to do it, but you won't be effective for the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 6 and 14, Paul said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath that with believeth with the infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul was not saying here, don't live in the world. But what he was saying was be separate. He says you're going to be in the world but not of the world. 
you got to work in the world. you got to go out in the world. I, I told somebody the other day, it's been a few months ago now, we were talking and, and they told me they had to do something that was against our, our, uh, our word that we preach here. In other words, what God has said we should do. They came and says, i got to go. I, I can't do that. They're going to make me do this to have my job. And I says, that's not true. I says, unless you start it out that way, then it'll have to stay that way. But if you start it out and show them that this is the way I believe and this is my belief, they cannot stop you. And church, I'm here to tell you, it's time for the apostolics to stand their ground. Come on, apostolics, it's time to stand their ground. Be separate. Come on, I've been changed. God didn't just change me by, by change, giving me a new name and baptize me. But you know what? He changed my lifestyle. It's a separation that I'm in now. We live for the purpose of God, church. And what the purpose of God is, 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 is that to make sure that his name is glorified all through the earth. That's his purpose. And men and women find themselves in the Lord. And, and, and we, we, we need to find ourselves in the Lord tonight. And our Savior tonight is our purpose. Amen. B- back to Joshua 10 and 10. And I'm going to try to really, I'm not saying I'm closed. I'm just going to try to hurry up and close. But John 10 and 10 says this, And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter of Gibeon and chased them a long way with it goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Machaeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast them down great stones from heaven, them to Azekiah, and, the, and they died. And there were more which died than the hell stones than they which the children of Israel slew with a sword. Now, when you choose to be separate for the purpose of God, okay, not, I'm not talking about being this weird dude or this weird girl. You know, I've seen some weird people. I, I really have. And I, I've seen some people live way out there somewhere. You know, I'm not talking about trying to be weird or somebody supernatural where you can wave your hand over everybody. And if you got that power, I'm not talking bad about you. That's great. But, but I'm not talking about this weird situation. But I'm talking about, uh, or, or, or two, I'm not talking about not associating nothing with the world or, or, or not talking to people out that's not in your faith. I'm not talking about that because, after all, I mean, uh, that is the call of the gospel to reach those that don't know Christ, right? To start, to start looking for those that don't know Christ and try to win them. I'm not talking about uh, trying to get weird and go stand in a corner somewhere all by yourself. I've seen people want to start these home churches, you know, and not get out in the world. I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about is, is applying this gospel to people's lives that don't know about it. You see, what we are, we're separate. Why we're separate is because we have, we have what we call, uh, we don't have the same value system that the world has. We're different. Our value system is different. We're not looking for the uh, Wall Street to give us our supplies, but we're looking unto God to get our supply from. Amen? If you're looking for the world to give you a supply, you're going to fall, my friend. But if you look toward God, you will get your supply. Listen to me. When we choose to separate, when we choose to live that separation, the Lord will fight for us. When you choose to live a separated life, the Lord will go before you. Just as he sent the hailstorms to kill the enemies of Joshua in Joshua chapter 10 here, uh, my friend, God will, will fight for you. If you'll let God go before you. We come to the one of the most profound moments in, in the Old Testament, verse 12 of chapter 10. And I'm getting really close to being done tonight. But listen to verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered up to the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon the Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of the, of the Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jashar? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down upon the whole day. And there was no day like that before it after or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of the man, for the Lord fought for Israel. How many wants the Lord to fight for you tonight? I believe Joshua must have known that we're about to win this thing, but we're about to run out of daylight. Church, I want to tell you, we're about to win this thing, but it's getting very dark. It's getting dark. We better let the S-O-N shine on us tonight. 
We better let it shine bright on us. We, we, we've got this battle. Come on, friend. Victor, we got this battle, buddy. You got this battle. You, we, you're going to win this battle. But somehow or another, we got to say, son, stand still for a little bit. Put, put a little uh, sunshine on me. I, I've got to get I believe he realized that I'm fixing to win. I'm fixing to conquer the enemy. And hear me, my friend. Here's what we, this speaks to us tonight. When we were separated for the purposes of God, when we're walking forward and truth is beginning to explode in our lives and in our hearts, and when we begin to turn and pray to God, guess what he's going to do? Then when we do that, he's going to turn around and he's going to stop everything in our lives. Just like he stopped the sun for Joshua. What do you mean stop, brother? What are you talking about stop? I'm talking about everything that was set in motion by sin. Everything sin has brought in our lives by the birth of association, whatever you want to call it, by the words which were spoken into our lives. When you choose separation, guess what God's going to do? He's going to step in and he's going to say stop. What's he going to say stop to? He's going to tell, he's going to tell torment, that, that thing that's tormented your mind. He's going to stand in. He's going to say torment, stop. He's going to say suicide, stop. He's going to say drug taking, stop. He's going to say drinking, stop. He's going to say anger problem, stop. He's going to say bitterness, stop. He's going to say hopelessness, stop. Come on, he's going to say uh, angry problems. I said a moment ago, he's going to say stop it. This man is ready to live for me. You stop everything that's coming against him. I'm going to tell you, when you choose tonight, I believe Kyle First Pentecostal Church, uh, we need to choose tonight. To, I am going to be separated. I'm not going to be like the world. I'm going to be different. And then when we do that, when God stops everything, we can step out and say, by the grace of God, I am going to be what God has called me to be. By the grace of God, I'm going to be what he's called me. By the grace of God, I'm going to glorify Jesus in the earth. I'm going to tell everybody about him. I'm going to heaven, and I want to take a 1,000 or more people with me to heaven. By the grace of God. Come on, anybody want to take somebody to heaven with you? By the grace of God, I must go through every wall. Every troop that comes against me, by the grace of God, I'm going to jump over every wall, every troop. These five evil kings, they saw what was happening. They said, we got to stop this. But you know what? When they saw that the, they had the winning team, they saw that the Lord was on their side. They saw that these guys are unstoppable. The five kings, you read your Bible, they ran up and hid themselves in the cave. They got chicken, they got scared and said, oh my goodness, uh, all of our men's dying. We better get away from here. They're going to kill us too. Uh, I come to tell you, the enemy cannot win against you if you live a separated life. He cannot win against you. He may come in, but when he comes in, just ask for a drink of water. That's pretty good. But little did hell know that day that when they ran to the tomb, the orders were going to be put out. Hey, close it down. Throw some stones in it. Cover that tomb up. But little did they know as well when they rolled that stone in front of the tomb of Jesus Christ that millions would be changed that day. Millions of people's lives would be changed. All, and, of course, he would be held captive. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he proclaimed liberty to the captive and opening to the prisons to them that were bound. The same spirit that raised Jesus shall also quicken our mortal bodies. Church, I'm here to tell you, not, not only did Jesus pay the price for sin, but you know what he did? He opened the way for divine life. That we can have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Ain't that awesome? Church, we need to be all God has called us to be. And verse 19 says this in our text, And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies. And smite the hindmost of them and suffer them not to enter into their, their cities. For the Lord your God had delivered them into your hands. Church, if you're here tonight and you've heard this message, you hear me tonight. Don't let the enemy find refuge in your camp. Don't let the enemy come in and change your household. 
Hear me. There's been many, many people that I've sit back and watched, and there's nothing I can do except, oh, God, because they wouldn't listen to me. I've tried to help. I tried to warn. I sit down with families, and I try, look, I'm concerned, and it turned against me, and they used me, me as, the, as, the, uh, uh, as their, their downfalls, and they said they, they, it was my fault. And everybody's looking for a victim. Everybody wants to be a victim, so they want to blame somebody else for their downfalls. But hear me, church, tonight. Don't let the enemy come in and change your household from what you've been taught for years. I've seen people be in the UPC, apostolic doctrine, man, they get so strong in it, and the next thing you knew, the enemy came in and says, it don't have to be that way. The enemy comes in your old spiritual house. He says, you know what? That couch will look better over on this wall. And before you know it, you started rearranging your separation. You're rearranging some things. And before you know it, the enemy is telling you what to do instead of you telling him, put another log on the fire. So tonight, church, do not let the enemy come in and destroy you because he wants to come in and he wants to throw envy and lust and hatred and strife and that hopeless, that depression, that suicide thought back into your head. But whatever is your fighting thing in your life or your fighting is, don't let the enemy find safety in it because he'll get comfortable there and he'll begin to, but what you got to really do is you got to start pursuing after him. And I'm going to close with this, Sister Lane, if you'll come. Psalm 68 and 1 says, Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away as the wax melted before the fire. So let the wicked perish as as the presence of God, but let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him with riding upon the heavens by his name, Jaya, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless and the judge of the widows is a God in the holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in his families and bringeth out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious dwells in dry lands. As pastor tonight, I want to tell you what I feel. I feel we need to let God arise and let our enemies be scattered. Let them get away from our lives. You know what? That, that, That can be used, I believe, or we can be used for God's purpose that He has in our life. Joshua said this, don't stop. Don't stop what you do. Don't, don't let the enemy find safety in you. Don't let the enemy do that, but, but make no peace with him. But pursue after separation. I come to tell you tonight, if you let the enemy have control, there will be no separation in you and you're, than the next person that don't have the Holy Ghost. If you got the Holy Ghost, there ought to be some difference. If you got the Holy Ghost, it ought to be uh, the way you talk is different. Everything you do, I mean, if you got the Holy Ghost, let me just be honest with you, your checkbook is even going to be different than those that don't have the Holy Ghost. It is. Think, come on, one preacher said it like this. You can look at a man's checkbook and see his priorities. And a lot of times you can. But that, I'm not here to preach about your money tonight, but I'm here to preach about the enemies coming against you. But listen to this. If you can pursue and be separate... By trusting God to enable you to pursue it by prayer. you got to have prayer. You can't pursue it just by singing a good old foot stomping song. I've seen people that if, if the service didn't have a fast drum beat and the singer wasn't really getting down and having a fast song, they wouldn't worship at all in church. But as soon as them drums start up, boy, boy, you'll see them just getting shouting. Because, see, it took music to move them instead of God. It did. But see, but prayer, you never saw him praying. You see, prayer will make you move forward into your life. I'm here to tell you, when you move into prayer, you won't never let darkness come in and dominate your life. But you'll dominate darkness because when you got prayer in your life, the light comes on. The S-O-N shines in and it brightens it up. And then guess what? When you have prayer, you'll have control in your life and the devil won't have control. That's right. Let me ask you, who, who here tonight, I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass nobody, but who here has blood pressure problems in your life? Raise your hand. Brother Haley, let me ask you a question. What happens if you don't take your blood pressure medicine? It goes high, don't it? You get dizzy-headed, high. You know what? If we, that's when the devil comes in and he takes control. 
You see, it doesn't matter how big of a man you are. If you got blood pressure, it don't matter how many muscles you got on top of muscles. If you got blood pressure medicine, that blood pressure mess up, but it'll make that big old body do this number. You get dizzy headed. And it doesn't matter. See, and that's the same way with prayer. You don't have prayer. It doesn't matter how intelligent person you are. You just get all out of source, all out of balance in your life. Everything goes crazy. But with prayer, guess what? We can have control. How many like to have control back over your home? Really and truly, control over your house. I'm not talking about the man of the house, which I think that's another message that could be preached around here some probably. But uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone tonight because I can see women already raising their eyebrows up at me. But I'm talking about throw back over what's right in your house. We're not letting this CD come in. We're not letting this DVD come in. We're not letting this game come in. Well, I let them play it on mute. You know, it don't matter. Yeah, but when you leave it, that mute button goes off. And they got it right back in their ear. Church, let's take back control of our house. The enemy wants to take control. But we can't let no enemy have control. The only thing the enemy needs to do for us is give us another drink of water. Put another log on the fire, buddy. But if you get out of your source, it's time for you to get out of here. Amen. Let's all stand. I want us to come pray for a minute tonight. And I want us to find ourselves in our life or where we at in our life. Say, God, I don't want to have these other things having control of my life. I just want you to lead me, God. That's it. Just find your place. Let's pray together. Sister Land, please.
together there's no one higher than you redeemer defender our great and mighty savior there's no one higher than you you are always with us gracious to forgive us by your power we've been set in wonder you reign with love forever there's no one higher than you your beauty your splendor your glory knows no measure there's no one higher than you Savior, great and glorious, there is no one higher. 
bigger, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior. Hallelujah. If you know it, sing it with him tonight. There is no one higher, no one one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior. Praise the Lord. Don't you feel the Holy Ghost in this place? God, I just love you tonight, Jesus. Your grace for me is always enough. There is no one higher than our God. Oh, there's no one. Yes, Jesus. Glory of your name. Thank you, Lord. There's no one higher than you. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord tonight. There's no one higher than him. Praise the Lord.